What's up, everybody? Matt Kajeski here, back again with the Stochastic DFS channel. And today we're talking college football DFS ahead of Thursday slate, December the 29th. Three games to get into. Before we get started, make sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when this and all other content goes live. And if you're listening on podcasts, make sure to leave a rating and review. Subscribe over there. Thank you guys if you've done that. It really helps a ton, and I appreciate it very much. And last thing, we are brought to you guys today by No House Advantage. And they have a new $100 first match deposit bonus, formerly 50 bucks, but they upped the ante, and you need to check them out. It's a cool and unique way to play player props. There's a couple ways you can do so. They have a traditional verse the house function. That's their listed player props. You go in, make lineups, and if those props win, you're winning cash prizes. But they also have pick them contests. That's you versus other people in tournament style contests. They've had prizes as big as $25,000. You're making lineups of player props, putting them on a confidence interval, the ones you're most confident in at the top. Then if you beat everybody else, you're winning the prizes. Better yet, a lot of times these contests are overlaying. That means they're not filling. If they have a $25,000 prize and we don't get enough entries, they're still paying out that money no matter what. So check them out. Link in the video description below to take advantage. Let's bring you behind the glass. Talking some DFS. All right, we've got a couple weird games. Well, really one weird game and then two elite ones. The weird one is actually the first one. It's Syracuse taking on Minnesota. 42 total, very low. 10-point spread in favor of Minnesota. A lot of opt-outs in Syracuse. Not really skill position players, just Sean Tucker, but there's a lot of defenders that are gone, some offensive linemen, and it's caused the spread to balloon in favor of Minnesota. First things first, Syracuse, 73rd in pace, 48% pass rate. They also lost their offensive coordinator, so this may change. Garrett Schrader should be playing here. He's a mobile signal caller. 406 rushing yards this year. He also had been hurt multiple times. So I think he's a little shy of where he may have actually been, assuming he played the whole season. As a passer, 211 yards on 24 and a half attempts. Again, it's not going to be the most voluminous passing attack here. But Schrader, given that he's mobile, I think is an outside consideration for tournaments. It's really hard to back a 16-point implied team total with some of the other signal callers we have on this slate but he's not just a straight up X out because he can run the backfield. Sean Tucker opted out of this game. And the crazy thing with Syracuse is only three running backs took snaps the whole year, which is crazy behind Sean Tucker who vacates 258 touches. LaQuint Allen comes in at 34. I think LaQuint Allen is going to handle the Sean Tucker role to what degree and how much efficiency is, to be determined, but at 4,100, I think he sees at least 15 touches here, making him a value play. Juwan Price is the only other running back to take snaps this year, and he only has five touches. He's a transfer from Florida International, if I'm not mistaken, but I mean, I, he hasn't played in weeks. I don't even know if he's healthy. You're not going to get a lot of good reporting on Syracuse. I'm hoping we get some news and maybe a depth chart for the game, but right now they haven't released one. Their beat reporters have speculated, but to sum all this up for DFS, it's LaQuint Allen or pass. The receiving game, they did lose Courtney Jackson to transfer. They also lost, let's see, what's his name? Anthony Queeley to transfer. He hadn't played in weeks anyway. Not, not very much of this matters. CJ Hayes has been injured. It's basically just Courtney Jackson, who's an impactful transfer of this group. Or Rondé Gadsden's been their target alpha. He averages 74 yards per game on just 6.6 .6 targets. At 6K, that's kind of difficult to get to on this slate just with so many other premier studs, but he'd be the guy I look to first. And from there, I think this is probably going to be even more condensed than normal. Generally, it's four or five that rotate in and out of this offense at receiver. Devon Cooper, 3.3 targets per game on the year. I think his routes increased. Damian Alford's actually had a really good route rate lately, up above 80% in some games. And we've seen that with six targets in back-to-back -back games. If I'm ranking these three, it's Gadsden one, Alfred two, Cooper three. Trevor Pena, he didn't play in the last game. I believe it was injury related, but there's been no update on his status. He would be four, and then behind him would be Demarcus Adams. These guys are just GPP plays, and again, we're talking really thin plays with the 16-point implied team total. Tight end is a rotation. 
Maximilian Mong leads it, but you'll see multiple guys here and they run four wide sometimes. So it's tough to get to Minnesota 10 point favorites, extremely slow. 130th in pace. They have a 34% pass rate, but their team total at 26 is at least semi-attractive here. It looks like Tanner Morgan's coming back, which is a big boost for offensive efficiency. I'm not sure Morgan's a guy we want to play just because they really prefer to take the ball out of his hands, but he actually is much more efficient than Kali Akmanis. So this is a boost for the offense, but again, he only averaged 165 and a half passing yards per game this year. Are we really going to play Morgan on a slate with Florida state, Oklahoma, Washington, and Texas only in the biggest of tournaments, in my opinion, in the backfield looks like Mo Ibrahim is going to play. He's averaging 28 touches per game, 146 rushing yards. He has a role in the pass game, too. They don't throw a lot to their running backs, but he runs a decent amount of routes, about 40 to 50 percent of the, the routes he's out there participating in. So Ibrahim is a solid play. Trey Potts is a change of pace. So if you want to maybe like for GPPs, run them both. If this is a blowout, maybe you think it is. That's something you could look at. But Ibrahim should probably be one of the first guys in your lineups. Pass catcher. Again, it's not going to be a voluminous passing attack, but you could walk into some efficiency. Brevin Spanford has been the favorite for me to target all season long. He only trails Daniel Jackson by three yards for the lead on the year. It's 484 for Jackson, 481 for Spanford. Spanford has three more targets. He's also 600 cheaper. I think he's a very easy, just one for one pivot here. And essentially all these guys are within $1,000. Jackson at 48, Spanford at 42. He's my favorite. Brown Stevens at 41 and Dylan Wright at 4K. The guy I'm least interested in is Dylan Wright. He's recently begun splitting time with Lameek Brockington at 3,400. But ultimately, we're probably spending too much time on the worst game on the slate. So my apologies there. Let's go to Florida State, Oklahoma. This one's a banger. 66 total, 9.5 point spread in favor of FSU. They're 84th in pace with a 46% pass rate. Their team is mostly intact. Jordan Travis is coming back next year. He's going to play in this game. He has 367 rush yards on the year. We know he's very capable there, efficient as a passer, over 230 yards per game on just 26 attempts for Travis. Implied team total here is excellent, almost 40 points. Travis is going to pop in some optimals. I think that's completely fine. This backfield, it had been a three-headed monster for most of the year, but we kind of have seen some of it condensed towards Trey Benson. He's only 5,400 as well. He touched the ball I guess it should they carried the ball 20 times in their last game. He touched it 23 times over the last three games. He has touch counts of 20, 17 and 23. That's come at the direct expense of Lawrence Toafili and Treshawn Ward. Now Ward had been battling an injury. He missed multiple weeks. The three games I just referenced were Benson were also the games where Treshawn Ward had returned. Maybe you could argue that with an extra month off Treshawn Ward will be healthier here and he'll go back sort of into that 50-50 committee he had been with Benson. But I think two things work against that. Benson, really just one thing. Benson's been so good in Treshawn Ward's absence that I'm not sure you mess with the rotation right now. And then the price difference. It's only $300 to go from Ward up to Benson. It seems much safer to just play Benson. Unless this is a leverage play for you, I think Benson's the one-for-one -one play in the situation. Toa Feely is a bit different than the other two backs we talked about. They do use him as the third down back. So his role is a bit more carved out than Ward and Benson. He'll play regardless, but he plays in more specific packages. I think he's fine, but again, he's a bit close to Benson for my liking here as well. I think you can play all three, but Benson would be your cash game style play, low risk style play. Receiver's been tricky. They started the year really injured, and now they're almost fully healthy. So you've seen the route rates ebb and flow for these players all season long. So the top three are going to be Johnny Wilson, Micah Pittman, and Ontario Wilson in no particular order. I personally prefer Johnny because of the big playability and the size. He's also been the most efficient, nearly 700 yards for him. Ontario is two for me. Pittman is three. That's the exact order they're priced. But you have to look at the route rate for these guys and it's not really to decipher them. It's just to point out the inconsistency game in, game out. Because they're fully healthy now and they can involve some of these tertiary options, which we'll talk about. Most recent game, Johnny Wilson, 49% of routes. Micah Pittman, 64. Ontario Wilson, 77. Now, I wouldn't read too much into this. 
The two games before Ontario Wilson's 77% route rate, he was at 42% and 29%. It's just, it, they rotate on and off the field. They can keep these guys fresh because they have so many receivers. Don't look too much into this. That is how I would rank them. Cam McDonald is their fourth most targeted pass catcher. He's actually their tight end. I think he's fine for a price adjusted play if you're paying way down. His route rate is good. You're not going to see as much rotation at tight end. But then those of you playing the large, large field tournaments, you're going to see Malik McLean, Kentron Poitier, Marqueston Douglas is a backup tight end, Ja'Kai Douglas, Deuce Span. they all play. If you look at their route rates for the most recent game, I'll give you that at the very least. Malik McLean, last two games, 54% of the routes, 18%. Kentron Poitier, 21%, 33%. Tight end two, Marqueston Douglas, 17%, 10%. And then Ja'Kai Douglas, 25%, 33%, Deuce Span, 50 to 10. I think the player I'm the two I'm most comfortable with are Ja'Kai Douglas and Kentron Poitier of this group. But don't feel good splitting hairs here. This is tough. I'm trying to pay up if I can. Oklahoma, second in pace is the Jeff Levy offense, 44% pass rate. Tons of opt-outs, two starting offensive linemen, Eric Gray, a couple defenders. Dylan Gabriel's back, though. He's gonna play. He has 298 rush yards, which is solid. Averages 265 and a half on 31 attempts. He also missed the majority of a game. I believe that was the TCU game. But he's efficient. He has decent mobility. The total in this game is solid. I think you can play Gabriel. You can also stack him pretty easily. We'll get to that part. At running back, this is what we really have to decipher here because Eric Gray is vacating 250 touches. He had at least 20 touches in four straight games. They also haven't had Marcus Major. He's been injured. And we got a glimpse at Oklahoma practice. We don't often get this, but he was still in a boot as of this week. So I think it's going to be Javante Barnes leading what could be a committee between him and Tawi Walker. Barnes is 92 touches. Walker is 19. So I think Barnes is a guy we want to get to on this slate at a cheap price in a pretty competitive game. At the very least, a high scoring game, at least projection wise, based on the total. Barnes is a Decent pass catcher, I think. Again, it's just hard to evaluate. He hasn't played a ton this year. Receiver, we lost Theo Weiss. There's a couple other deep, deep receivers that aren't going to play in this game, deep pass catchers. So I think we can kind of actually condense this more than we have in the past. Without Theo Weiss, I think your three wide receiver sets are pretty clearly going to be Marvin Mims, Jaleel Farouk, and Drake Stoops. Now, recently, Jaleel Farouk and Theo Weiss had kind of been benched not exactly, but they'd been almost in a 50-50 rotation with each other. That's with Drake Stoops participating in almost 90% of the routes week in, week out now. He's playing more at the expense of Farouk and Theo Weiss. However, with Weiss out of the picture now due to transfer, I think Farouk is probably back into his normal role. These guys are all very close. Mims, I think, is a slight cut above them. Efficiency-wise, over 1,000 yards. The next closest on the team is actually tight end Braden Willis. We'll get to him at 444. But the gap in pricing is not enough where I think you want to pivot down specifically for Mims unless you absolutely need to save the salary. And then from there, it's going to be Drake Stoops, number two for me, Jaleel Farouk, three. But I think you could argue Braden Willis is ahead of them both. His routes have been more consistent than these players. He has more receiving yards. He's actually kind of been more efficient, too. 53 targets. It's the fewest of this group, but very involved overall. From there, I think Daniel Parker is going to play a bigger role here. I don't know how much we actually see of him, but he's been the tight end two most of the year. LV Bunkley Shelton's a rotational player, hasn't been targeted in the last four weeks, but his route rate's okay. Just another name to mention. Final game, Washington takes on Texas, 67 and a half total. This is great. Three point spread in favor of Texas. Washington's 47th in pace is 60% pass rate. They're running the air raid. They're actually mostly intact here too. Skill position players, good. Offensive line, good. It was a top 10 unit as well on that front. Michael Penix, 8,400. He's not the most mobile, 86 yards in the year. But the biggest thing we can say about that is he's not taking sacks like he did at Indiana. He's only taken four sacks all season long. And Indiana was the exact opposite. He might have taken 44 sacks in the year. I don't know. I, off, I don't know that off the top of my head specifically, but the fact that the offensive line keeps him upright, it's a boost is DFS protection because you don't have to worry about him taking negative yardage. As a passer, 263 yards per game on 42 attempts. The floor here is just so solid for Penix. There's opt-outs on the Texas defense. They're also weaker in coverage. Their strength is their defensive line up front, which, again, the offensive line should neutralize. Like Penix here a lot for tournaments. 
The backfield's a timeshare. It's Wayne Talapapa, maybe with like a 60% share, 50%, somewhere in that range. Cam Davis, 30 to 40. And then whoever's active of Richard Newton, Will Nixon, they'll take up the rest. Newton did miss their most recent game, so that's worth monitoring. But even as the running back leader, Talapapa, only averaged 12.9 touches per game. Maybe he gets their own efficiency, but again, tough matchup, good run defense. I think you could pay down for the Jovante Barnes, the LaQuint Allens, rather than paying up for Wayne Talapapa here. And also, I want to pay up for some of these Washington receivers. These are some of the best plays on the slate. You had two 1,000-yard receivers in Jalen McMillan and Rome O'Dunes. I prefer O'Dunes in a vacuum. Again, it's a very close 9.1 targets per game to 8.8. Only 200 difference in salary. I think a lot of constructions, you can play them both. McMillan's been more active of late, 9.3 targets per game over the last four. Two O'Dunes, 6.8. I want to play at least one of these guys. Jalen Polk's the three, almost plays in every single route, just a bit behind those two. 5.3 targets per game for him, finished with 649 yards. He's priced efficiently here, completely fine. The tight ends, I think you can play as well. These are your salary saving guys. Jack Westover and Devin Culp, 37 and 3,400. They're pretty active. I mean, Westover averages 4.3 targets per game over the last four. Devin Cole comes in at 2.8. I think you can use these guys. And last, if you want some complete dart throws on Washington, we'll give you the routes because you, you do have a couple of guys down here, like Giles Jackson that I think are worth mentioning. Sorry, I was on a team way up alphabetically in routes. As I go down to Washington. All right, got it. So last couple games. You had Giles Jackson. He was at 16% of the routes. Taj Davis was at 19. The week before, that was basically flipped. But essentially, you're not seeing more than a quarter of the routes for either of these guys. They're just pure dart throws at this point, both around 25% of the routes on the season. Texas, 35th in pace, 50, excuse me, 45% pass rate. They're favored here, so they have a good team total, above 35 points. Quinn Ewers under center. He's been awful this year. He takes... I mean, he doesn't take a lot of sacks. Eight on the year, he just doesn't run at all. He has no design rush attempts. Seven on the year, to be exact. He's only scrambled six times, just hanging in the pocket when they do decide to throw, which hasn't been frequently recently. So he doesn't give you anything as a runner. He only averages 200 pass yards per game on 28 attempts, clearly trying to take the air out of the ball. The problem is now you have Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson opting out. You do have Jonathan Brooks and Keelan Robinson in the backfield. I, this is hard to decipher. Keelan Robinson's like 185 pounds. He's played a lot more than Brooks on the year, but like due to the size, I don't think he commands a full workload. I think Brooks is probably your bigger back. And honestly, on the back end, it's a bit of guesswork, but I have them projected almost evenly with Keelan getting a little more, bit more receiving work, Jonathan Brooks getting a little more rushing work. But I, I think I'll just play the cheaper guy if I need to. I think it's probably going to be pretty close between these guys. Maybe even see Jaden Blue. He carried seven times in the second most recent game, but only 15 on the year. Pretty pretty tough to decipher this without Bijan and Roshan. They vacate over 300 touches and over 2,000 yards combined. Incredible. Receiving game is pretty intact here. You've got Xavier Worthy as the leader. 99 targets in the year. That's 8.3 per game, 56 yards. I think he's completely fine. Jatavian Sanders, their tight end, also fine. 5.5 targets per game, 48 yards. And then Jordan Whittington, he's down a little bit below in terms of target volume. Actually, excuse me, he's tied with Jatavian Sanders, and he's been a little bit more efficient. One for one, I think you could pivot from Sanders to Whittington just in a vacuum, but there's not very much separating these guys. I would try to get up to Worthy if I can, but I'll play Whittington if needed. The wide receiver three is a rotation between Casey Kane and Tariq Milton neither of whom are particularly targeted. I don't really want to get to them. Casey Kane, typically playing tight end, don't really want to get to him either. It's pretty difficult to trust any of these guys on the back end. But that'll do it for us. Three-game breakdown. Got into the weeds. Thank you guys for sticking with it. Hit the thumbs up button on the way out. Leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think. Would love to hear it. And if you want to reach out, I'm on Twitter, Matt at Matt underscore Gajeski. You can chop it up with me there if you'd like. Otherwise, we'll be back all throughout bowl season, breaking down every slate. So stick around. Until then, have a good one, everyone, and good luck.